So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So my name is Heikki Palkama, and I run a department called Projects or New Building Projects in company Arctic Helsinki Shipyard. And uh, first, I would like to, in brief, tell you a little bit about our company, so you know where I'm, I'm coming from. After that short um, presentation of the Arctic offshore potential, which has been, been published and we have been following very closely. Then a, a review of our interests in different parts of, of, of the world. How, how we see the, the uh, development in those areas. Then something about uh, really about the technology, about the products that we build. And then a few words about the future, how we see it. So Arctic Helsinki Shipyard is a, a joint venture between a um, uh, Finnish company, STX Finland, which is owned by a Norwegian company, STX Europe, which is owned by STX Group in South Korea. So basically, South Korean firm, STX Finland. And then the other half is owned by United Shipbuilding Corporation from, from Russia. And that is the state-owned, very big uh, yard, shipyard company, owning roughly 45 shipyards in, in Russia. All the big shipyards belong to this, this company. We are a very, very young company, so our operations actually started in, in April 2011. So we are maybe two, two and a half years old, old company. About 400 employees, and we specialize in Arctic shipbuilding. And uh, this means ships, this doesn't mean, mean oil platforms or, or infrastructure on lands, it's only ships. We are a very young company, but the same location in Helsinki, it's a long history. So it started on, on 1865 at the same place, and here is described roughly what is the history and how many name changes and, and owner changes has been in our company. This was the place where it started, and this old dry dock still exists in, in, in our area. And this is what the shipyard looks today. This picture is from the area from the time when we, when we built uh, cruise vessels until 2004, but the area and the shipyard area looks still about the same. Little bit of the Arctic offshore. Uh, the offshore industry going into the Arctic regions, of course, it's an interesting factor for us, because whatever is done there, uh, one needs ships to go go there or service the places or build, build the structures. And uh, there has been studies and estimates of the undiscovered oil in the Arctic. We can see here that it's, it's on the, on the uh, uh, north of Russia. There's a lot, lot of undiscovered oil also around the Greenland area and also on the, on the north of, of Canada. And it has been estimated that about 13% of the undiscovered oil is in this Arctic region. Then the gas is also there. It's a little bit on the same area, so it goes hand by hand, oil and gas. And uh, the areas are pretty much the same. And it has been estimated that about 30% of the undiscovered gas lies in the, in the, in the Arctic area. So we see a lot of, of potential for, for Arctic ships need in these, in these areas. Then a little bit more closely of the geo geo geographical uh, areas. For example, the, the Arctica, the top of the, of the North Pole, 
So there is a lot of, of demand for sea base research. A lot of countries are interested in searching the, the seabed. And also there is some hints of, of tourism in there. So the potential for us would be icebreaking research vessels and more conventional icebreakers. Then on the Barents, Petchor and Karasis, there are, are a lot of potential on the offshore oil and gas industry. There's a, a lot of found uh, reserves and the investments decisions are, are awaited on, on many, many of those. Some of those has been a little bit postponed and it, go, it goes hand in hand with, uh, with the oil price and with the, with the other uh, discovered oil fields. Here the potential for us, or for ships, are tankers, LNG carriers, platforms, platform supply vessels, subsea work vessels, anchor handling vessels, tugs, icebreakers and so on. Also on the, on the gas, oil and gas um, research, there is a need for research vessels and, and uh, seismic vessels. And I would say all of these needs to be somehow ice strengthened or, or ice breaking capability. So they are interesting to us. Then Sahalin area, Sahalin island area, east of Russia. There is a lot of operational oil fields already and a lot of plans to develop this area in, in, in phases. And here again the potential is a bit similar than in, in parent sea. Tankers, LNG carriers, platform supply vessels, anchor handling vessels. And this is especially interesting for us because we have already delivered some vessels to this area. So it is uh, realized already for today. Then there is a lot of uh, discussion about the northern sea route and the traffic through that is expanding every, every year. The amount of traffic compared to the southern route, it's not big, but it's growing with huge percentages every year. And the potential here would be very big polar icebreakers, even bigger nuclear icebreakers, and then of course ice strengthened cargo vessels of, of different sorts. Then there are also a little bit south of, of the Arctic some areas where there's ice and cold, and, and we are of course interested in those areas also. For example, in the north part of the Caspian Sea, there are, are um, oil fields underbuilt already, and there's potential of this um, shallow icebreakers or shallow icebreaking supply vessels. And with this shallow, I mean down to 2.5 meters in, in, in draft. Of course, close to the Finland, we have Baltic Sea, which is frozen every, every winter. And here is, of course, the traditional icebreakers need, but also the, the um, uh, transportation with ships from Russia out is, is expanding every year. So those uh, vessels are needed also. <coughs> then Greenland, there has not yet been any, any realized projects for us. But there are these oil fields, gas fields uh, planned, and in that area is also the supply vessels, ice breaking ones, and the anchor handlers are, are needed. The same thing is, is, is in north of, of Canada and US. Uh, in addition to the oil and, and gas, there are a lot of mining uh, activities which logistically need, may need some ships or, or icebreakers, so we are looking at those projects also. And also the, the area is so vast that there is a uh, need for Coast Guard vessels, and uh, they actually, Canada is actually building at the moment one. And then Antarctica, 
it's a little bit different area in that respect that the most of, of the uh, vessel needs are related to the servicing of, of the scientific stations in, in Antarctica. And it's a little bit different uh, surroundings, the ship types are, are different what are needed. So they are very, very uh, multi-ships, multi need to have ice-breaking capability, cargo capability and also logistics to get the cargo to the uh, islands or, or to the ice. So we try to look at these areas very, very closely um, and use our, let's say, historical ex experience and knowledge on icebreakers. So the first icebreaker build was in 1910 and uh, it's over, over 100 years now that we have been building in the same, same location and uh, about 60% of the icebreakers operational today are, are built, built here. Then when we go to the technology, what kind of ships? So our portfolio is ice-breaking supply vessels, which is one of the, let's say, biggest potential what we see. Ice-breaking cargo vessels, again, that niche is, is very narrow on, on the, let's say, very heavy ice-strengthened cargo vessels. Traditional icebreakers, of course, and then these kind of multi-purpose vessels. For example, here we have icebreaking rescue vessels. Many, many disciplines combined into a one vessel. This needs a, a lot of development and, and uh, ideas how to enhance the vessel's capability in, in, in heavy ice. And uh, some of the innovations that, that we have been developing or being a part of the development team. One is this concept of double acting ship, which means basically that it goes bow first in the open water and aft first in, in the ice. And the bow can be optimized for a low consumption in, in the open water and the aft for a very effective ice breaking. Shallow draft icebreakers I mentioned already. This 2.5 meter uh, draft limits a lot of design parameters. They are very, very special looking ships and special type of ships. Then shallow draft nuclear powered icebreakers. The shallow draft actually here means about eight and a half meters, so it's not so shallow anymore. But on a nuclear icebreaker brand, it is, it is quite shallow. Then electrical body propulsion system developed in, in, in Finland and enhancing a lot on maneuverability and the ice-breaking capabilities of, of, of ships. And then the concept of oblique icebreaker, which actually breaks ice going sideways. Few products what we have so far uh, built or are under construction at the moment. This is a typical product from our uh, ice-breaking supply vessel. Uh, which went to the Sahalin area. Two pieces of those around 100 meters in length and almost 22 meters in, in, in width. And um, uh, 13 megawatts on the propulsion power and 18 megawatts on installed diesel, diesel power. Combines the cargo carrying facility, ice breaking facility, standby uh, vessel uh, function close by to the oil platform and also rescue facilities if something happens on the on the oil platform and can can have um, uh, water guns on top of it to extinguish fires on the on the platform and so on this is an example of this oblique icebreaker vessel so it actually can break ice going sideways. This is a multi-purpose vessel in that sense that the main function is actually a rescue vessel. So this goes to the, to the Russian state and um, has rescue facilities uh, to rescue people from, from other vessels. Also has an oil spill collecting facilities 
and um, uh, as mentioned, ice breaking. And then there is this kind of a operational center for education needs also. So very, very uh, multi-purpose, special designed vessel. And the third type of vessel that we are actually on construction at the moment is a <clears throat> normal diesel-powered icebreaker for, for Russian state. And uh, this is a little bit bigger than the supply vessel. It's one, uh, 120 meters in length and, and almost 30 meters in width. Quite powerful, powerful icebreaker in, in, in this Baltic, Baltic Sea area and also summer seasons in, in the Arctic. So these are the type of, of, of ships under construction today. Then a few words about the future. I mentioned ge geographically the potentials. Uh, this slide represents uh, Russian published information that how many vessels there would be a need between 2010 until 2030. And uh, we can see over 90 90 icebreaking supply vessels, over 45 icebreakers, huge numbers. Then smaller icebreaking vessels, 140. So, of course, I don't know what, what is the committee for the future predicting to be, but, but of course we would like to see that even portion of this would realize in, in this time frame. So we would have a lot of ships to build. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vicky. Welcome. I have to ask you, uh, how long time do you build one icebreaker? Of course, you have different kind. How, how many hours does it bring for 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 the labor? Well, normally a let's say a supply vessel, 100 meter uh, length vessel. So from the contract until delivery, it's normally two years. But how many people are there? The peaks go up to six, seven hundred, but of so course it, a lot of jobs. it is a lot, a lot of job, and it of course starts very slowly on the design phase. So it doesn't at the beginning uh, employ so many, but then then at the peaks six hundred. Before I give the microphone to other people, so uh, the ships in the Baltic Sea have to change the gas because of the sulfur directly or have sulfur cleaners in, mm -hmm. the, in the ships. It's not in the Arctic area still, not yet. But uh, what, what, what is the uh, future of the ships turning from diesel to gas or nuclear power? Well, uh, gas is coming and, and there are gas ships built already. The problem with gas is that it takes a little bit more volume of the vessel yes. to, to do the same distance. And, and, and so it's a combination that for which service this vessel goes, whether it can utilize gas or not. But of course the gas is coming and also these kind of uh, uh, very high light distill uh, diesels also. And of course we need to be prepared that this comes reality in Arctic also. Suffer, right? yeah. Yes. It's in emo anyway. I am all yeah. uh, accepted the treaty. Uh, and Russia has to follow that also in the, in the future. Uh, so you said that you are delivering uh, the ships more to Russia than anywhere else, but what are your competitors? Canadians and uh, some other Koreans? Well, we have competitors. We have from Norway, from Germany, from Russia, okay. from Singapore, for example, even from, from Korea. So, any other questions? Mark? Yeah. He's now a veteran of uh, ETA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, this was very interesting and uh, one of the points so that uh, definitely that's very advanced technologies that you are all the time using. So uh, how long has this kind of development been going on in Finland in general, but then as well what is the role of uh, universities, Alto especially with their uh, huge ship lab there at the campus and then is VTT as well involved on, on this kind of development? So the beginning beginning of the let's say ice model testing was in the in the 
end of 60s, early, early 70s, a long time ago. So it has been a long process. For example, this uh, innovation of this oblique, oblique icebreaker, it was invented mid-90s. And this is the first vessel to, to come realized. So it takes a long time, so it may be 15 years from the innovation to, to real life. So, so it, it needs a lot of research, basic, basic research, basic studies. And in these respects, uh, the university, Alta University and VTT, they have a key role. They really do. And, and uh, um, I must mention that, that the Arctic ice research is one, but still we need ship designers also. So these are also ships. So, so, so many times we concentrate that the ice breaking thing and the ice research is, is the key issue. Of course, it's, it is a key issue, but these are still ships and, and need also the designers for, for, for building them and designing them. So, any other questions here? I think uh, we thank you in thank this you. space and uh, we really wish you well and uh, you can give jobs for Finnish people because we have been having difficulties mm. with, the, with the shipyards. Uh, uh, we have been building really big uh, ships but now this is the future maybe here in the Arctic area. Thank you. Maybe. Thank, thank you so much. This is the time.